again. It's over. He's done it again. Unbelievable. Oh, oh, straight into the roof of the net. Nice one. Straight down the middle. So a good performance. Hello and welcome you're watching First Sports here with me Rupa Ramani. Let's get started. Right on the show today, the build-up to the Border Gavaskar Trophy is heating up. The Indian cricket team is already feeling the pressure. A whitewash against New Zealand, injuries sustained during practice and a new captain to lead the charge in the first test. How is India preparing? to face the mighty Australians. Meanwhile, Yannick Sinner has had quite the year, many highs and a few lows, but he's ended the year on a solid high, winning the ATP season ender finals. What's made him stay at the top? And the Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul bout was anything but that. The winners were their publicists and promoters. How did the bout go? And did it rankle the boxing fans all around the world? Stay on for all of that and more, but first, a look at the headlines. England's fifth and final T20 international in the series against West Indies was washed out. Batting first, West Indies were 44 with, without a, losing a wicket after five overs when it started raining. The ground staff attempted to salvage the wet outfield for the game to resume, but the match was abandoned without a result. England won the series 3-1. In football, England beat Ireland 5-0 to secure their Nations League promotion to the League A group. Harry Kane made the opening goal in the 53rd minute after shortly that Anthony Gordon and Conor Gallagher followed through. Jared Bowen extended England's lead to 4-0 in the 76th minute. Taylor Harwood Bellis scored the final goal to seal the game. Mexico coach Javier Aguirre left bloodied after being hit by a can. This was following a 2-0 Nations League loss. The attack occurred as Aguirre walked to shake hands with Honduras coach post the game. Fans at the stadium hurled objects, injuring the coach's head. The violent incident overshadowed Mexico's dismal performance in the first leg of the tournament. In hockey, India beat Japan 3-0 in their final pool match at the Women's Asian Champions Trophy. For India, Navneet Kaur broke the goalless deadlock in the 37th minute. Deepika Kumari converted two penalty corners in the fourth quarter to give India a 3-0 lead. India will play against Japan again in the semi-finals tomorrow. And in darts, teen prodigy Luke Littler won the 2024 Grand Slam of darts. Littler crushed Martin Lukeman 16-3 in Wolverhampton. This is his first major TV ranking title in a debut year on the professional darts corporation circuit. The victory will help Littler move to fifth in world rankings. The Border Gavaskar Trophy, BGT as it's called, is scheduled to kickstart in just some days from now. There's a lot of buzz around India's preparation for the big series. Head coach Gautam Gambhir is already under fire. That series against New Zealand, a whitewash, was a wake-up call for the hosts back then. So the pressure is on the visitors now. Here's someone else who won't feature in that first test and probably that's why is facing some of the heat, Captain Rohit Sharma, who's just become a father a second time. He and his wife, Ritika Sachdeva, are parents to a baby boy. And he has decided to give the first test a miss because of this. And that's been met with a lot of backlash. Fans a tad too critical there, pointing out that he should have been there for that first test with the Indian squad already behind the eight ball. But life happens. How can you make the most of the hand that you're dealt with and how can you make this situation work for your team? That's what the Indian management, the think tank need to be thinking 
about now because the pressure will also be on the man stepping in to lead the charge in Rohit Sharma's absence. India's lead pacer Jaspreet Bumrah, the right man to step in and lead India. Now, now, how is India preparing for this particular series? It's a humongous task. Usually there are warm-up matches that the visitors tend to play whenever they're touring a country. They play with the host's A or B string sides. India cancelled those matches and decided to do match simulations instead. A few former cricketers, particularly Michael Vaughan, did not find that decision too smart. I can't get my head around a team like India only wanting to play an intra-squad game leading into a series against Australia in their own backyard. I just can't see how you get yourself in that competitive mindset of consequence by playing an intra-squad game. Time will tell. Vaughan may have his own set ways and is always overcritical, especially when the team involved is India. But does he have a point to make here? Could a match against one of the host teams, a warm-up game, have prepared India a little better on what to expect when the series begins? It is going to be a first for a few of those players in the Indian ranks and a series against Australia in Australia is a litmus test. It's a trial by fire. Champions are made and many broken in such series. And India is going to start on the back foot here. They don't have their skipper at the start. We've mentioned that. Though he will be there, he will be amidst them because he'll be travelling well in advance, but he will not be there in that first test. So in addition to missing his services as a skipper, they will miss an experienced batter too, an experienced opening bat. And that's not all. India will also miss the services of one of their top order batters, Shubman Gill. Reports say he got struck on his thumb and that, he, and that has ruled him out of that first test, with the management hoping against hope that Gill will be fit and back for the second. Kale Rahul, who showed some prowess with the bat, also had an injury scare. He was struck on his elbow by a Prasid Krishna delivery, but nothing serious to put him away. In fact, Kale Rahul provided some spark in that match simulation over the weekend. Australia holds, in fact, very special memories for Kale Rahul. And maybe this is where India will look to him to stand tall. The other batters waiting in the wings are Abhimanyu Ishwaran, who was called up as a backup for Rohit Sharma and Devdutt Padikal, who has been asked to stay back post the India A series. Padikal has of course placed, played just one test for India and it came against England in India in Dharmshala. Could these men make it to the 11? But with some serious experience with the bat missing out in that top order, India could also be tempted to bat deep. A bowling all-rounder then, that could be an option with Harshit Rana or Nitish Reddy primed to making their debut, possibly. Speaking of fast bowlers, here's a sight every Indian cricket fan was waiting for, the return of Mohamed Shami to a cricket ground. He hit the ground running in his domestic comeback at home and is set to get on that flight to Australia. What a sight it will be to watch him bowling alongside Jaspreet Bumrah. That ought to boost the Indian morale in the series with the World Test Championship final on the line. First test is critical and that could make all the difference. But, but is India ready to take off from the get-go? The 2024 tennis season has come to an end and one name is on everyone's lips, it's Yannick Sinner. A year that not only tested him, but also established his dominance in the ATP circuit. Two Grand Slam victories and five ATP Tour titles. This weekend, he notched up the season-ending ATP Finals title, swept aside Taylor Fritz in that final and he did so without dropping a set. Not only was that the eighth title he managed to snag this year, Sinner also made history by becoming the first Italian to win the tournament. But he isn't dwelling on those achievements. I'm, I'm not looking about, you know, being the first whatever. It's, it's, it's just stats what, you know, I'm, I'm, what's now written. But, you know, me always try to improve as a player and then trying to understand what I can do better. And 
this week was something where I always felt the ball very good and even in practice sessions it was very smooth going and uh, you know the connection with the crowd was very nice so you know let's see what's coming next year it's um, you know the future nobody can predict. He mentions the connection with the crowd and yes that certainly was one of the highlights. The entire tournament was for more, little more than a week in the Italian city of Turin. So Sinner did have that home advantage when he played Taylor Fritz in the final last evening. The spectators took it up many notches. The Inalpi Arena in fact transformed into a sea of orange. Fans turned up in orange wigs, orange hats, jackets, you name it. With some even munching carrots. All of it of course a tribute to Sinner's hair. Yeah, for sure it was a very high quality week, um, starting from the beginning, um, trying to understand the pace of the of the court, which you know then increased a little bit, you know, which is normal because it was a bit more consu uh, consumed, and uh, you know I just tried to play the best possible tennis I could in every single moment, which I've done here, and then the crowd helped me a lot. So it was for sure one of the most special weeks I've I've had in a tennis court. Um, yeah, so I'm very happy to, to have this trophy. So what's worked for Sinner? It's his quiet, reserved persona, which is quite the contrast to his explosive tennis on court. He carries a sense of calm in him, no flashy declarations, no pressure-filled goals. He forgets all that hype and focuses on the tennis. Sinner isn't loud or brash, and that's probably what makes him so much more striking. I mean, it's, it's my, my goal was to understand what I can achieve, no, this 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 year there was no specific goal of winning a Grand Slam or being number one or, or whatever, and it's gonna be the same next year. I mean, it's it's you know whatever we can catch, we take, and then and the rest we learn, and and I think that was the mentality we we approached uh, this whole this whole year, and um, you know trying to you know to raise my level in in. in in specific moments, which I've done uh, throughout this year. And yeah, he says he raised his performance in those specific moments and it's been that kind of a year for him, extraordinary to say the least. He started the year as world number four, but on the 10th of June, he zoomed into history books. He became the first Italian to achieve the number one ranking in ATP's history. By clinching the ATP Finals trophy in Turin, five straight wins, he took home a staggering $4.8 million the biggest champion's prize money in the history of the tour. Sinner's victory over Fritz also saw his final win tally go up to 70 out of 76 matches. He, in fact, this year, as win percentage against top 10 opponents surged. Entering 2024, Sinner was 22 to 27 against top 10 players. After his win over Fritz, he's 17 to 5 for the season, a 77.3 win percentage ending this year. Sinner's biggest tool, of course, clearly has been his consistency. As you can see, he's been able to score big wins over top-ranked opponents, basically holding his nerves and staying cool in the major moments, like he mentions just a while back, and especially against quality players. That's a trade that's made him trump over rivals like Carlos Alcaraz, who's had a topsy-turvy year himself. But it hasn't been all smooth sailing for Sinner. Mid-season, he faced doping allegations. He tested positive not once but twice for a banned substance, Clostebol. Sinner maintained it was accidental contamination and he was cleared of any wrongdoing by the ITIA. This decision, of course, faced a lot of flack because many other players on the circuit criticised this move of letting Sinner off the hook and there was severe backlash that Sinner himself faced from all possible quarters. But he put his head down and shut the noise out, making sure his racket did all the talking some maturity about his head and an emotional strength that matches all of his prowess on the tennis courts. But this doping controversy is far from over. The World Anti-Doping Agency appealed the decision in September and the Court of Arbitration for Sport, the CAS that is, is sitting in on the matter. They are yet to issue a final verdict which they will sometime early next year is what we hear. Now a decision averse to the one that ITIA has given could mean a ban for Sinner for a period up to two years. That could come as a big blow, especially when he's at the cusp that he's showing. But as Sinner has displayed, he's taking it one day at a time, one match at a time. He's managed to ride out 
a bit of a stormy up and down 2024 and will look to continue with that very same fervour come 2025. A boxing event that was hyped like it would be the best thing you could ever catch, the best spectacle that you would ever be a part of. Two superstars across different spheres coming together to fight it out. The publicity was massive, the craze, the fanfare, all the build-up to make Mike Tyson, the baddest man on earth, versus Jake Paul, a YouTuber, was sensational. An OTT platform was live streaming it. The media was hard selling it. It was meant to be the perfect popcorn consuming event. End result, the most underwhelming bout and an even more disappointing after party. A fight that began on this note. Yeah, that was the hype just before the fight took place over the weekend and that ended up something like this. That's not what the crowd had come to witness. In a unanimous decision, Jake Paul was declared the winner by all three judges. Mike Tyson was seen as a floundering second at best. He failed to attack and Jake Paul threw in enough punches to end up on the winning side. And don't worry, we won't of course dissect or go into a detailed recount or count of the review of that fight, but how the entire exercise ended up being a bit of a failure on all counts. One, the fight itself was clearly a massive disappointment Take Jake Paul's entry. Number two, he did not come in a car or any cool motorbike, but a custom made truck bigger than his boxing career ever was. It didn't just stop there. Jake's flamboyant boxing gear was on display, one that is estimated to cost a million dollars. It featured 380 carats of real diamonds. So opulence, check. Going overboard, check. Being practical, we are still checking that out. So imagine all of that just to punch out a retired boxer. Now, honestly, Jake's entrance told you everything about this fight. All fluff and glitter, and no real substance. It was for the optics, especially when this event was promoted as the clash of two titans and the hype was going through the roof. I think uh, for Tyson on his side, it's definitely risky. Uh, hoping he, nobody gets seriously injured tonight. Um, hoping this is Tyson's last fight. Because <laughs> Jake is a lot younger and more stout. You know? <laughs> We're really here for, for Tyson because I followed him in the 80s. So I really liked him in the 80s. Now, whether he's up to it or not with this younger guy you know, is going to be seen. But I'd say if he can do good within the first, second round, he might be able to do it, you know, if he goes for a knockout. But if he has to go the whole eight rounds, it could be trouble for him. I got my money on Tyson all the way. People say it's the age difference. It's only 30 years old. He's still got the beast in his eyes. He's going to win. 
And to be honest, it worked. Netflix saw massive numbers of people tuning in, so much so that the OTT platform suffered significant outages. Users reported buffering, many said the application malfunctioned. Over 85,000 users reported issues in the US. Yeah, all those messages, those signs, if you were one of those viewers tuning in and had to see black, like I did, honestly, that was probably a sign to switch off, tune off right then. But for those who persisted, like me, the match started off slow. Tyson, who hadn't fought professionally in 19 years, probably showed, came out swinging in round three. He landed a couple of decent shots on Paul, but Paul somehow kept a fight that maybe should have ended sooner. Going firing in some solid punches occasionally to keep things a little interesting. As the rounds went on, it became evident that Tyson's age wasn't doing him any favours. His once feared knockout power was nowhere to be seen. In the end, Jake Paul, of course, ended up paying his respect to Mike Tyson. First and foremost, Mike Tyson. It's such an honour. He's the GOAT. I look up to him, I'm inspired by him, and we wouldn't be here today without him. This man is an icon and it's just an honor to be able to fight him. I didn't prove nothing to anybody, only to myself. I'm not one of those guys that looks to please the world. I'm just happy with what I can do. His opponent on the, in the ring, Mike Tyson, also responded, being all modest. This is one of those situations when you lost but still won. I'm grateful for last night. No regrets to get in ring one last time. To have my children see me stand toe to toe and finish eight rounds with a talented fighter half my age in front of a packed Dallas Cowboys stadium is an experience that no man has the right to ask for. Not the kind of uh, end that we were hoping to witness, but let's be honest, Paul, Jake Paul could have ended the fight way earlier. Instead of finishing it, he kept the match on, letting Tyson hang around longer than he should have. Almost like he was trying to avoid an embarrassment for Tyson. This fight will surely go down in history, not for the reasons anyone hoped it would, though. It's a prime example of how we all got tricked into buying, buying into something that wasn't going to end the way we hoped to, only to realise it was all a farce. The only real winners uh, were the promoters. The fight was not about respecting boxing as a sport. It was about creating the headlines, generating that buzz, the views and the chatter. And in that sense, yes, it was a success. Time for last serve, Rafael Nadal has touched down in Malaga where he will play his career's last match. It's the Davis Cup time. He was all of the centre of attention as he hit the practice courts. That wraps it up here on First Sports. I'll of course see you again tomorrow. Till then, do take care. Bye-bye.